Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're really excited to be here tonight with Daniel M. Lavery in conversation with Kat Kinsman for discussion of Dear Prudence, Liberating Lessons from Slate.com's Beloved Advice Column. Based on the long-running advice column, it's a collection of the most eye-opening, illuminating, and provocative installments during Daniel M. Lavery's tenure as the titular Prudence. So first I'm going to introduce Kat Kinsman, who is an award-winning writer, editor, public speaker, and host with over 15 years of experience creating food and beverage-based stories, essays, videos, podcasts, events, books, and live news commentary for Food and Wine, CNN, HLN, Extra Crispy, Tasting Table, Roads and Kingdoms, Gravy, Savoir, AOL, and other media outlets. I'm hungry just reading this list. Um, she's a spot after keynote speaker, moderator, and discussion facilitator on the topics of food and mental health, and created the Chefs with Issues initiative in 2016 to address the mental health crisis in the hospitality industry. Her book, High Anxiety, Life with a Bad Case of Nerves, was published by HarperCollins in 2016. So welcome, Kat. And um, welcome to you, Daniel. Daniel M. Lavery is a former Dear Prudence advice columnist at Slate, the co-founder of The Toast, and the New York Times bestselling author of Text from Jane Eyre, The Mary Spencer, and Something May That May Shock and Discredit You. He also writes the very popular newsletter, The Shatner. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we're so happy to have y'all here. Um, Daniel, we have, you know, followed your your career through its many iterations, uh, mostly followed you on Twitter and appreciated your um, humor and wisdom there. Uh, we don't follow very many people on Twitter, but we do follow you as a, as a store um, mm -hmm. and, and really have just appreciated your honesty and your integrity through, you know, being a public figure um, and a queer and trans public figure and the, the way that you have moved through the world in your career. So it's a real honor to have you here. And it's great to have everybody watching with us tonight. So I want to encourage folks, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat at any time um, or pop them in the Q&A box, which is just below the chat. Um, and Kat will work them in um, as as we as we are able. But um, for now, I'm going to pop out of here so that y'all can get right into it. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Eva. Thank you. <clears throat> Danny, this is part of my long con <laughs> here too. Get to spend some time with you because I also you know, have been a giant fan of your work for such a long time. Uh, while I want to spend the whole time asking you about what it's like to be with three dogs in your house at once, <laughs> um, what I want to ask you is when you become your prudence, is there a ritual handing over of garb, of mantle? Uh, how did that all come to be for you? Um. I, I, I should, there should be a little ceremony. You should like go with the next prudence into the ocean and do something together and then walk back out wearing different clothes. Um, I, I should have gotten one started and I didn't, but I'll talk to Janae and see if she's interested. Um, also, just in the interest of maintaining my honesty and integrity, it's just two dogs now. Mr. Wilson has gone back to the Bronx. He is only with us now in video form. We all miss him very much. But in your heart forever. Oh, all the time, all the time, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is a little bit like temporarily being Santa Claus, as Tim Allen explored in his trilogy, The Santa Claus with Ease. Um, so I, I had heard from uh, the then editor-in-chief at Slate back in 2015 that the previous Prudence was moving on and they were looking for somebody and they wanted to know if I wanted to audition. And it, it just, it, it truly felt like, do you want to be Santa Claus for a few years? So. Um, I hadn't trained for advice columnist jobs. Um, I was simply really excited uh, and I wrote a lot of emails and then eventually I got it. So that was the closest uh, that, that there came to being a ritual, I think. Is there, what is that audition process like? I mean, it really, it did feel a little bit like trying to become the giver. Like there's no path for this. You're, you're supposed to, you know, be, be selected for what you're gonna do. And instead, you know, someone says, ah, oh, Jonas, you have special eyes. Go with this old man and figure life out. I don't remember the giver that well. Uh, they <laughs> have those who remember Tim Allen as <laughs> Santa. Those were formative movies. They, the first one I want to say came out in 1994, which I feel like is the first year that my brain really came online. Like I was eight and I was reliably forming permanent memories just left and right, like you wouldn't believe. 
but that wasn't your question. It was, what was the process like? So they emailed me, I think, six questions that they wanted me to answer. And all of them had been answered previously by one of the earlier Dear Prudences. And at that point, I had a couple of lousy day jobs that I had gone through in sort of quick succession where I mostly was supposed to answer emails and then the rest of the day figure out what to do with my time. So I read the back catalog of all of the Dear Prudences and Ask a Manager and a bunch of other columns. So every time one came up, I was like, I know this. I know the original prudence said, I know what I would say. I read like, this is my moment. I was made for this. Uh, and after about six or seven rounds of that, they, they suggested I give it a shot. So I said, yes, absolutely. I would love to do that. I'm assuming for people who play, I don't know, fantasy football or something like this, this is, this is your, your version of that. Your I mean, it's, it's advice columnist. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the, had you been an advice column person before that? Because I, I grew up reading Dear Abby and all of that, and I was obsessed with all of this. Was there, did you grow up seeking that 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 sort of genre? Was that uh, that sort of milieu yours? Or is it something that you sort of came to when this became available? Well, I, I like you, I think, grew up reading Dear Abby and Anne Lander. But in retrospect, there's something very charming about thinking like, oh yeah, I was eight and like reading the paper which just feels so old fashioned to me. It's like, oh yeah, I took my little suitcase and went to, to business school. Um, but yeah, I, I would read the paper and, and like, I think most kids, like the comics page and the, the advice column page was the best part. Um, and then I also came across a copy of uh, Since You Ask Me, which was Ann Lander's first anthology from 1963 at a used bookstore when I was in high school. And I just loved it. I, I loved both the sort of chicness of like early 60s style and etiquette um and i also loved that there were these like twin sisters who had like rival advice empires that felt so uniquely american and again like, if you look at dear abby and ann landers now they're both in the second or third generation of the same family like holding on to the advice like people don't usually leave like if you get to the level of like nationally syndicated advice columns people die in the harness like they don't come and go. So I, I hope that in like 200 years, there's like three or four rival factions in what used to be the American West that's run by like old advice family. But, uh, I feel like, is that a, I think that it could be a beautiful thing, a very dangerous thing. Is this our apocalypse? Is it like cordyceps and advice columnists? Just I was thinking a little bit more like Canticle for Leibowitz, like your third post nuclear uh, apocalypse forgetting, but that would work too. Um, but, but yeah, so they were big uh, influences as well as in, I think, 1999, there was a, a TV, a Lifetime movie about them. I was starring, wondering, there had to be. Yeah, starring Wendy Malick and Wendy Malick. Wait, she did a twin act? She did twins, yeah. She played twins. And, but, you know, I mean, what, what gay child in the 90s didn't <laughs> shine whenever Wendy Malick came on screen? Like, she was the reason I watched Just Shoot Me. She was incandescent and watching her get increasingly exasperated with herself and like in like a yellow sheath dress holding a cigarette, just like, why can't you stop taking my career personally? It was just, it was perfect. It was sublime. I loved it. Who will be playing you and you in the, uh, in the version of this when they make the film? I, listen, obviously I would love anyone to play me. I'm narcissistic as much as anybody, but you know, Ann Landers and Dear Abby had like 45, 50 year careers and like changed the face of the American newspaper. I answered questions for five years on a website. You don't get Wendy Malick for that. You got you to work a little hard if you want Wendy Malick to pop on a mustache and play you in a movie. Because the answer to your question is, I want Wendy Malick. I think I, I, you have spoken it into existence, so now I think it needs to happen. I don't know what she's up to right now, but if she's free and interested in tweaking her, her hormonal regimen. <laughs> I know somewhere she could go for advice on that. So with, with all of this, like, yes, there is, there is, there is fun. I always felt like these columnists of your things got to a certain level emotionally but not beyond they could engage up to a certain level but beyond that um they were perhaps out of their depth and the game has changed a lot especially since things have come online and especially just as you know you're a person who's very much influenced the culture and, and national dialogue on a whole lot of subjects so there's 
so you are maybe getting some of these lighter hearted questions, but the emotional weight of a lot of this coming in there, uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I've noticed that too. And I couldn't tell you exactly when the change seemed apparent to me. I'm sure some of that probably had to do with uh, like Dan Savage's rise to national prominence um, and, and Dear Sugar, certainly. Um, but but yeah, I, my, my memory of advice columns in the 80s and 90s is somebody writes one, possibly two paragraphs. And maybe it's about something quite serious, but there's a limit to how much of their personal affect they're able to put into the, the paper. And you kind of would get a sense too of how it had been edited into a house style so that they would often be sort of using familiar phrases that you kind of recognized probably didn't come from the original writer, but from the editor or from the advice columnist herself. And then you're getting two, maybe four paragraphs in. And so, you know, certainly uh, Dear Abby and Ann Landers were touching on all kinds of incredibly sensitive subjects, mm -hmm. but there wasn't quite that same, um, they were still operating in certain uh, restrictions of like public polite conversation where you retain some degree of privacy out of uh, deference to other people's boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then at some point in the aughts that shifted into more often you would see, here's a longer personal story from the advice columnist, um, or here's more of a sense of what this makes them feel like. Um, and so one of the things that I kind of liked about coming into the Dear Prudence model was I felt like there was a good balance there of not quite as old school as just here's what you ought to do, uh, smoke tarots and cigarettes, um, but but also wasn't asking the advice columnist to write a beautiful novel with each question and and really like put a memoir into it. Um, so that was something that appealed to me about this one. But gosh, there was one other column that I was thinking of that I wanted to bring up, and I wonder if I'm going to remember it uh, before. I run out of steam and I don't think I am. So, oh, so I, I was, cause I have to say like the, with, with these advice columns, I've, you know, long read them for the advice, but the, you're, you're right that it is in this era where it, it is an art form in and of itself. The actual writing is so great. I think of, I think of yours, I think of um, Heather Haverleski. I think of, you know, just a lot of the people these days who are writing these columns and, now it warrants a book, a beautiful, beautiful book. And I would actually really love it if you would dip into a section. Um, can we maybe start with toenails? Absolutely. I Thank would be you. really happy. So uh, this is from the chapter, The Care and Maintenance of Your Estrangement, um, which doesn't mean that every question in this chapter is explicitly about family estrangement, but at least it touches on some elements of it. Um, and this one, I wouldn't blame her if it did. So this one is, Dear Prudence, my husband has an extremely obnoxious habit that I have spoken to him about several times over the past five years. He will pick at his toenails while watching TV and then leave the remnants on the couch where he's been sitting. I will periodically find large chunks of toenail clippings randomly on our couch, coffee table, and floor. It's not often, but every few months I will find these lovely gifts. I have explained to him that it is disturbing and gross and embarrassing if someone were to come over. I have politely requested that he do this in the bathroom. My requests have gone unnoticed. I feel disrespected and grossed out. I have begun to passive aggressively handle this by picking up the clippings whenever I find them and putting them in his coffee cup. I know this is wrong, but I find some relief in making him discover his own toenail clippings in his coffee. What else can I do? How can I help him understand that this is neither acceptable nor fair to me? She signs off, end of my rope. Do you need a minute? Should we, should we like poll the audience what they think before I go into the answer? And I will not also please uh, feel free to put things into the Q&A because Danny will be answering questions. Yes, I saw somebody mention that they don't usually get my references to films and books. I, I apologize. I don't know if that's good or bad. I just, if you, if you want, I can look up the name of the Wendy Malick movie. It, it escapes my mind right now. But if you just Googled 1999 Lifetime TV Wendy Malick, I think you would probably find it. And I, will, I bet it's good. Back to the question. So this was my answer at the time. This question showed up in my inbox well over a month ago, and I just haven't been able to answer it. I can't stop thinking about it either. The fact that the odds that are now fairly good that you two are quarantined together Let's just say that you, dear letter writer, have been on my mind a lot. 
There's part of me that thinks, look, almost every human being has at least one private habit that's sort of disgusting and sort of comforting all in one. And shame isn't a very useful tactic when it comes to changing behavior. And then there's a part of me that thinks, my God, how hard is it to clip your toenails over a trash can after being reminded every couple of months for the past five years? How careless can one person be? The basic tools of the advice columnist are usually some combination of time, distance, and perspective. But I don't have any surefire techniques for getting someone to pay attention after you've tried reminding them, explaining your feelings, reasoning with them, and pleading for half a decade. In your position, I might very well find myself tempted to do the same thing to him and feel simultaneously defeated along with a certain thrill of vindictive pleasure. Is your husband an ordinarily reasonable, well-meaning person? If so, I'd try to see if I could use this escalation as an attempt to snatch up some sort of victory. I need to admit defeat here. This has been so frustrating, so unmanageable, that I found myself putting your old toenail clippings in your coffee cup in an attempt to get your attention because everything else I've done to that effect has failed miserably for five years. You know that it grosses me out. You know that I end up cleaning up after you, which I resent. And you know enough not to do it at work or in public, only in places where I'll take care of it for you. I don't feel proud or happy about my actions, but I don't have any better idea, so I'm asking for your help. I'm clearly missing something. What are you getting out of this? What's going on inside of your head when you pull off your toenails and leave them on the table? Do you find yourself spacing out and forgetting what you're doing? What do you think would be necessary to get this to change? I'm absolutely out of ideas. What do you suggest? That's not to say he's likely to immediately chirp, I never thought of it like that. What a great idea. If I start doing X, Y, Z, I know this will never happen again. Expect a few uncomfortable silences and some initial defensiveness, but hold out until he's willing to offer up a solution or two of his own. I've done the heavy lifting for the last five years. I think it's fair to ask him to take the lead now. Good luck. I'm rooting for you. I often talk about wanting an update on letters, but I, I more than almost any of them, I wish I could hear from her. Because if she just left, I would totally understand. It's it's such a the the aggression, this quiet aggression behind both sides of, of that. It 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 uh it's been haunting me since I read it and I know it has you so it's very cell block tango, right? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, the a thing I hate about myself is that I have never seen Chicago. I do, I know enough to know that's Chicago. <laughs> yeah, just the premise is like a bunch of people who have killed their husbands all say like, oh, he was always chewing his gum. Um, or, you know. When the little things become a lot. But, exactly. But this, this seems to have taken up some emotional lodging within you. Do you make little rooms for each of, of these? What sticks with you? Sometimes it's it's strange details. So like toenail clippings every few months for five years on the coffee table, coupled with now I've been putting them in his coffee. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was just like a detail that really stuck with me because it's very, very vivid. And the thing that really drives me nuts about that one is I think if I drank a cup of coffee and got to the bottom and and there were toenails, mm -hmm. I would just, I would remember that forever. Whatever that was serving as a reminder of, even though I, I don't always have the best memory. I was talking earlier today about how whenever I start to cook beans, I always forget I'm cooking beans. And the next time I walk into the kitchen and see something kind of like brown on the stove, I'm like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Oh, it's my beans. Um, but if there were toenails in them, I would remember. It's part of your body. It's a, it's a, it's a thing. And even beyond the specific details of that, because I know that people, we must see the tip of the iceberg with what is sent to you. And that is a lot um, because, you know, I know when you're, you know, if you're a therapist, if you are, you know, a crisis counselor or something, they, they train you to be able to separate out um, with the, everything that comes to you and, you know, be able to have something so you can still care for yourself, but you must be reading so many people's innermost, you know, they're, they're, you, you know, some triumphs and all these things, but they're coming to you because they want something solved. How do you take care of yourself during that? Well, you know, one pretty straightforward answer is 
that's not my job anymore. So I'm doing great now. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for all that, some of them really stick with you. I think it's also at the risk of sounding super glib, we all have the toenails thing that to someone else feels like, how could you not notice that? How could you not change that? And then when it's us, it feels like, oh gosh, how could I have possibly remembered? Um, so I, I think that's part of what's at play as well is we, we all have the toenail thing. It's just luckily not always toenails. Um, you know, some of it was, it, it was just very clearly a job. So I would just be uh, focused on the questions while I was working on the column or the podcast. And then when I wasn't, I would really put it to the side. I wouldn't go through the inbox in my free time or try to do a lot of back and forths with question writers. Um, I knew I didn't want to, you know, there were times that I really wanted a few more updates, but I knew if I started going down the path of asking people for more details, I would never stop. Um, and, you know, sometimes it, it was a lot and sometimes it felt easy to manage. And as, as Don Draper reminds us, that's what the money is for. So that was, I think, the most helpful uh, reminder to separate myself from other people's problems. <laughs> Life advice from Don Draper. Always <laughs> a, a wonderful, on occasion, on point. You will never, uh, you won't believe how much this never happened. <laughs> it, it's really, and I say this, it's like I, I stopped watching that show after the second season, not because I didn't like it. I just started watching other shows. So it's not even I saw that episode and I'm like, ah, oh, I'll remember this. It's just that was the one that people put in gifts a lot for a few years. And it was all over Twitter. It was just people were always using an excuse to say that's what the money is for. So now I remember it as if he had said it to me. Yeah. Uh, but I want to touch back on your, you know, talking about estrangement, because I know that that is something that is a huge portion of the book. And it's so uh, culturally under discussed. It's it's a taboo. And um, and I mean, just. Yesterday, I had a, a friend uh, talk to me about, you know, an issue with family estrangement. I, you know, I've dealt with some of it uh, myself and you extremely publicly have. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, for the folks who are, are listening to this, um, you know, let, let's just talk a little bit about that and your, you know, anything you feel comfortable talking about um, just uh, to normalize the conversation around deciding to because there's some decision making in it because you can decide to stop as my, a friend of mine says running into the fist mm -hmm. um, it's a very hard decision to make could you uh talk as comfortably as you feel like about that yeah absolutely so uh and i think that does connect some to that previous question too mm -hmm. because during those first few months where uh, i was you know experiencing family estrangement but a lot of it was not yet at all publicly available information um i took a few months off, you know, I just emailed my editor and said, uh, family crisis, please cover for me for the foreseeable future. Um, so I, I really would not have been able to uh, work through those first few months and, and get questions from a lot of people about their problems. So at that point, I really did need to just um, ask for somebody else to step in. But, uh, you know, for, for all that it was just five years, those were five mm -hmm. of the most eventful years of my life. Um, I transitioned and then I became publicly estranged from my family and then my father lost his job as a direct result of that estrangement. Um, so it was, you know, it was, it was a, a productive time. And um, certainly, especially once I was able to kind of acknowledge publicly that I was estranged from my family and kind of the, the outlines of why that was, um, I got more questions about estrangement as a result. Just, you know, people naturally will gravitate towards asking the advice columnist who's become estranged from his family, if, if that's a question that they've got as well. So that was something that I ended up talking about more and more throughout my, my tenure as Dear Prudence. But, you know, certainly there are as many different types of uh, and reasons for estrangement as there are estranged families. And one of the things that felt really helpful to try to remember uh, for a lot of people who were sort of contemplating the possibility of estrangement was, um, it's not necessarily one and done. You might, you know, often people would be writing to me because they didn't want to become estranged. You know, they had a really difficult or painful relationship with someone for years that didn't seem to be getting any better, but they wanted to know what their options were or, or if estrangement meant, you know, consigning someone to outer darkness forever and ever. And 
And I think it is useful um, to sometimes remember. Sometimes it just means if you've been trying not to keep having the same fight 50 times and you just need to say, I can't keep having this fight, call me when you want to talk about anything else, but I really need you to drop this. You know, that's its own form of estrangement, but doesn't necessarily say you're bad, I'm good, never talk to me again. It just means if you keep trying to cross this one boundary, I'm not going to let you. But as soon as you're willing to not cross it, we can try again. So, so that's a useful type, I think, or even just saying, you know, I hope that maybe someday condition of their heart changes or their desire for closeness changes and I can leave that door open somewhat, but I need to, for my own peace, uh, you know, not try to force that. And, and sometimes it's, it's already here. Like you're basically already estranged in everything but name and help admitting it. So. But yeah, you know, it, it's something that is, I, I don't think, I'm sure there are people who have gotten estranged casually or lightly. I don't think they're usually the type who write to an advice columnist about that. So I will say that everyone who ever wrote to me about it was pretty, they thought about it seriously. Uh, it, it grieved them a lot of the time. Um, it, was a, it was a tough call. Do you have any particular advice because uh, a few cultural holidays coming up, Mother's Day, Father's Day and stuff, do you have any advice for people uh, prepping for those? I, that's a really good question. You know, um, I don't know that I have found certain holidays especially challenging. I think mostly just because it's it's often on my mind. It's not always the first thing at the forefront, but it's often there. So if I get a goofy, uh, you know, promotional email about Father's Day from some store I bought shoes at eight years ago, which happens all the time, because now if you buy anything, you sign up for emails from that place for the rest of your life. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to turn this into like a tight five on like there's too many emails. Oh, no. Nope. <laughs> I personally recommend, I have a lot of uh, email filters set yeah. up. For yeah. These particular. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think it's, it's good, you know, I think it, it's fine. Like I think when Father's Day comes up, I mostly think I already knew that my father and I don't talk. I'm glad to think that other people who have good relationships with their fathers are able to celebrate today. That's a good thing. Um, if I need to take part of today to, you know, kind of sit with some of my memories or talk about some of my feelings or just feel sad, I should do that. Um, but I think it's kind of a useful bracing reminder that I, I know I can sometimes get really narcissistic about my own estrangement. And I, I can sometimes kind of catch myself being like, now you guys won't believe this, but I, I actually have a bad father. Um, the hell, the only one in existence. You're not, you're not going to believe this, but my father is religious. And yet he's a danger to children. Like, and just like, I really do catch myself sometimes being like, you know, oh man, I really invented this problem. This is the height of, of the human experience. It's just like, there's a million people with this exact same problem. And not that that doesn't make mine meaningful or, or my experience uh, meaningful, just like, yeah. And, you know, and the best case scenario is you celebrate a lot of Father's Day with your father and then he dies. And then other Father's Day reminds you of his loss. So I, I think maybe the best advice I would have to offer is to take those days as an opportunity to do whatever you feel is necessary for your own well-being. And also to take joy in the fact that um, we don't all suffer and die at the same time. It's good that you know, when one person grieves, someone else is experiencing joy, someone else is having a mundane moment. I think it's really a gift that we don't, you know, every generation doesn't die at the exact same moment. Everybody gets to have their separate losses and griefs um, so that we're not all carrying the weight at the same time. So I think it's, you know, more when you're sad, but it's good that we have holidays. And I'm really glad that, uh, frankly, even for the times that I enjoyed being in my own family before I knew the depth of the conspiracy to protect pedophiles. I still let myself be like, it's okay that there was a lot that I loved about the way my mom read to me. Okay, that's still mine. I get to have that. And certainly for the first few years, I really needed to be in the sort of like, you're familiar with the expression bitch eating crackers. I, it has determined so much of my life. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If, if you would unpack that for folks who may not have heard it before. Yeah, just in case anybody here is not familiar with it. It's a description of a certain mindset when somebody else 
you know, whether they really wronged you or not, just you are so, you're so mad at them. You're so burned out on them. You have no patience for them. They could be quietly sitting in the corner of a room eating crackers. And in your head, you'd be thinking, there's that bitch eating crackers. <laughs> Like you just, you couldn't describe them neutrally if your life depended on them. And certainly for a lot of the first, I think, two or so years after my family estrangement, learning the degree to which my relatives had all colluded um, to protect my father and my brother's pedophilia, um, you know, it just, I, I didn't have room for, I, I needed everything to be just hatred and anger and rage like and she wore sweaters wrong and she ate breakfast wrong he didn't know how to drive like just everything was bad um and eventually when i was able to sort of settle down a little bit kind of realize like they're not they're not going to jump over the fence in the middle of the night you're away you don't have the same power that they used to their secrets are now out you don't have to be quite so vigilant and uh, intense I was able to get to a place of it's okay if I have fond memories of her teaching me to ride a bike. It's okay if I have fond memories of this book or them playing the piano. That doesn't take away from the rightness of the decision and the necessity necessity of the decision to become estranged. Uh, but that's been more recent, and and that took some time. It can feel like you're cheating on your grief, or you know, this this the finality of a decision, or or, or something like that, and. <laughs> then you get to a point where it just it's some stuff calluses over and you know and and it's okay time i if i i feel like time has a lot to to do with that time and distance and giving yourself that and you know and we were uh sort of talking uh beforehand also about you know religious trauma and how that can be the catalyst for a you know estrangement a lot of the time um and for you know any folks in the room who have experienced that, first of all, not alone, and uh, it can be a tremendous source of estrangement. Is that something that you uh, run across a lot in the questions you've gotten? Some, I think, less than than the estrangements and less than transition. Those were the sort of two big upticks. Um, I, you know, it, it would make a lot of sense for me to hear somebody else use that phrase. I don't think I would use religious trauma as a way of describing my own upbringing, although it's certainly true to say, you know, my parents were both ministers mm -hmm. and they abused their position within the church to do some pretty despicable things and that I am an adult who doesn't go to church. So like the, the sort of building blocks are there, but it's, it's also um, and not something that I necessarily consider myself like living in opposition to either. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's just more, I never, growing up as a pastor's kid, people sometimes ask, is it weird? And I could never really understand the question because it sort of felt like, well, I don't have a control group to, to operate against. Like there's no version of my parents where they're like a plumber and a teacher. Um, and so even now it just feels like, well, that was just their job. That's what they were. It was, it was what it was. Um, which is maybe a weird roundabout way of, of uh, trying to avoid something. I guess I'll just say that there are plenty of people who had really awful, painful, uh, destructive and distressing experiences with religion growing up. And especially because uh, children do not have a lot of rights uh, when their parents want to hurt them. Uh, there's not a lot that they get to do about it until they can at best like grow up and get away. Um, mm -hmm figuring out how to live with the after effects of that can be incredibly challenging, especially when it also colors your sense of your purpose in life or, or what might happen to your consciousness after you die. And so it can, it can be a lot. Yeah. And lest we make this entirely dire, the other th uh, thing that happens also in churches is weddings. <laughs> yeah, true. The, uh, the, the joy and <laughs> Broughtness that happens around whether it is one's own wedding, <laughs> whether it is somebody else's wedding, that uh, that people are part of the the um, things that it brings to the surface in our psyches and our families. We heard a humdinger of a story right before this that is not ours to tell. Yes, we did. <laughs> wow. Um, but if we, if you would like to select a passage about weddings. 
from your beautiful life. Yeah, I, I would be very happy to do that. And I think specifically this is when you were hoping that, that I would do that. Or if, you know, I realize that one's sort of dire as well. <laughs> if there's anything lighter than your... I mean, I think that the reason it feels less dire is because in the letter itself, we get a hint of how this person's attempt to control the situation has gone, which is to say she'd already been shot down. Oh, so. Shit. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry to like make a judgment about your letter writer, but your letter writer sucks. I, I think that's fine. I mean, this is honestly one of those ones that could have easily been written by just like a creative eleventh grader who wanted to like write a compelling villain. Um, whoever did write it, they did create one, whether it's really them or not. Um, but yeah, I, I always liked answering wedding etiquette ones too, especially when I started on the job. So like, I'm a 27 year old kid. I'm kid, not kid, but like I'm some goof who's been to like three weddings my whole life. And now just because I have this job, I'm like an expert on weddings. And oh, I think it came out. Weddings. I was the matrimony editor for CNN, like for a while, like no business doing so other than having yeah. been be married. I know. And at one point I like came out like hot out of the gate. It's just like, you don't have to make presents when you get invited to a wedding, just go. And <laughs> I got so many letters of people just being like, that's so rude. You shouldn't do that. I <laughs> absolutely realized that like no one agrees with me, but I still feel really strongly like, you don't have to bring a present, especially if you can't afford it. Like, just go. Presence is a present. Thank you. Like, it's great if you get somebody a gift, but like, if it's mandatory, it's not a gift. I don't know. Anyways, to your presents. My 27 year old daughter and her best friend Katie have been best friends since they were four. Katie practically grew up in her house and is like a daughter to me. See, that's the thing. I don't know that you would include this detail and then later include the other stuff if you didn't want to make yourself seem like a monster. My daughter recently got engaged to her fiance and announced that Katie would be the maid of honor. Katie's boyfriend is also a good friend of my future son-in-law. Problem is that Katie walks with a pretty severe limp due to a birth defect, not an underlying medical issue. She has no problem wearing high heels and has already been fitted for the dress. I still think it will look unsightly if she's in the wedding procession limping ahead of my daughter. I mentioned this to my daughter and suggested that maybe Katie could take video or hand out programs while sitting so she doesn't ruin the aesthetic aspect of the wedding. My daughter is no longer speaking to me. We were never that close. But this is her big wedding and I want it to be perfect. All of the other bridesmaids will look gorgeous walking down the aisle with my daughter. Is it wrong to have her friend sit out? Picture perfect only, please. I just like, presumably, again, if this is a real woman, you write a letter thinking, how do I make myself look as reasonable and good as possible? <laughs> and I just, I love the parenthetical of like, I'm not that close to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> She's just garbage. We never, but... got, we never really clicked. <laughs> um, so, and this was my response. I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around this letter. I encourage you to reread it and ask yourself that time-honored question. Do I sound like a villain in a Reese Witherspoon movie? You are presumably sympathetic to your own situation and are invested in making sure that you come across as a relatively reasonable person and yet you have written a letter indicting yourself at every turn. This girl is like a daughter to you, and yet you want to shove her to the side of a family wedding just because she walks with a limb. Your daughter's wedding will be perfect with Katie as a full and honored member of the bridal party. Her limp is not going to ruin the aesthetic aspect of the wedding. It's merely a part of Katie's life. It's not only wrong to have asked your daughter to consider excluding her best friend over this. It's ableist and cruel, and it speaks to a massive failure of empathy, compassion, and grace on your part. You must and should apologize to your daughter immediately. And I encourage you to profoundly reconsider the orientation of your heart. Maybe she did. I don't know. My goodness. I, I, I the, the, and like, and she could hand out programs while sitting. That, that detail too just killed me. It, it <laughs> dear God. Uh, I, uh, um, my own, personal wedding we arranged so much of it. my mother had you know no longer with us they had mobility issues so we made so much of it geared toward like her not having to do that and you know catered so she still got to have moments of attention and all this kind of stuff in a way that you know honored her her physical abilities and and all of this like if you uh, there's the, that whole thing in Twin Peaks you know I talk about Twin Peaks a lot fix your hearts or die like this is this is one of those situations yeah, and I think that there are people who want their wedding or a relative's wedding to reflect, you know, the family, the community as it is, and then people who feel like this is the day everything needs to be perfect, and by perfect I mean 
terrifyingly perfect. <laughs> and we have to get rid of anyone who doesn't look like a model uh, or, or sit right or um, who doesn't you know, reflect the way I think they ought to on the family. So it's time to just like sweep a bunch of shit under the rug. And that's a, that's a tough, tough mindset to have. Do you think your groomsmen could have that surgery from Gattaca where all of a sudden he's like six, six inches taller so we don't have to like change the pictures? Maybe we could do that. Like, Did you watch, uh, maybe, maybe not everyone did this, but we, we were able to watch Gattaca for extra credit in, in high school science class. And I remember thinking like, this shouldn't be extra credit. I'm not learning anything, but it was nice. <laughs> yeah. We all learn things. Guess what it's time for? What time? It's time for Q and A. We've got some questions. Wonderful. Yay. Jojo asks, if you were to combine your first book and this book and offer advice to literary characters, who would you wish to write in? Uh, I can't imagine wanting to advise literary characters other than um, encouraging Casabon from Middlemarch to keep on keeping on. Don't change a thing. Everybody in this book wants to change you. You shouldn't. You're flawless. Don't ever finish your book. Keep going. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. And so I just, in one of my other interviews uh, about this book this week, Casabon came up again, slightly more um, organically than now when I just shoot him one man. But I love him so much. And I think uh, he's fantastic. And I would appreciate him. And I would have made him happy if he had married me. <laughs> I think he would make anybody happy. I don't think that's true, but I appreciate that immensely. Um, but I would have given every inch of my life to making him happy. It would have been so easy. Don't tell him you know German. Don't ask him how his book is going. Read all of his pamphlets and write fake letters to the editors of his pamphlets saying things like, this is great. What do you think about page 79? And like send him down another footnotes rabbit hole. So he's just like happy with his little books, never finishing anything. I think that's good general advice to everyone. Just ask about people's pamphlets. Yeah, just um, uh, enable their worst qualities. <laughs> <laughs> what a utility. A question from Mallory: How do you bribe your dogs to be quiet for long enough to record a podcast episode? It's so weird hearing someone with my old name. I just feel like I yeah. actually stumbled on that for a second. Yeah, no, it's, it's, again, it's that total narcissism of just like, it's just the name. Names. It's, it's a human name that other people are allowed to have, but I feel very like, well, shouldn't you change it too? You don't have to transition, but you should You should be Nikita now or something. Um, I don't, they're often loud. I, I'm back in the studio these days, but for the first two years of the pandemic, I was only recording from my living room. And there would be times when we would just stop and they would, because a couple times a day, they like to chase each other through the house and scream and scream and scream. Um, that's their favorite, favorite thing to do. And you cannot stop them from doing it. So we would just have to wait it out. Or occasionally you'll hear them in the background doing their little howls, which is also very cute. I think I met them for three tenths of a second as I shoved a bag through your door. <laughs> oh yeah, when I was sick and I was just like, look at the boys, I'm sick. <laughs> They were perfect. I uh, want people to know my my dog is um, being very good and quiet here. And my other dog is uh, yelling in the backyard and I hope you can't hear it. We've got a question from Kelsey. What general or specific advice from your Dear Prudence or Big Mood Little Mood podcast guest has stuck with you? This is embarrassing because now I can't remember anything anyone has ever said to me. Um, and so it feels like nothing's ever stuck with me. I, I know that I can think of several guests whose approach to advice deeply moves me. Um, Wendy Lee, who's going to be in conversation with me at my event in New York later this month, was a guest on the show earlier uh, this year, or sorry, in 2022. And we had a pretty long, fabulous conversation um, about like, literature and thinking about attachments. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly like a, a sentence of hers that especially moved me, but that whole conversation felt really generative and delightful. So that's one that does stand out. Um, and, you know, just occasionally I'll hear from people talking about their own experiences in their lives in a way that feels really new, but really useful. And I'm always really grateful for that. I just, at this moment, have Zoom-induced uh, amnesia, and I, I couldn't tell you anything anyone's ever said to me. I'm sorry about that. 
Oh, we've got a follow up. Okay, says I'm very sorry for being Mallory. I was actually changing my name to Mallory when I looked up other people with my name to see if there are any connotations I should be aware of, and that's how I found Danny in the Dear Prudence podcast. Well, that's the sweetest thing I've ever heard, and uh, now I feel nothing but joy and delight. That was a chosen name. Now I can say, oh, I gave that to you. Sorry, again, the narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with me, and that's good and fine. You're your own person. Uh, that is lovely and delightful, and I think that's very, very cool. And I sure wouldn't want every guy named Daniel to say, you know, I don't know, Danny. That's weird that you thought my name. So, uh, <laughs> not well, but you have my blessing. And we've gotten a heart <laughs> from that, which I think is really lovely. Um, I am curious about how much follow up you do get from letter writers from from guests all of that because there's got to be I, I i sort of i imagine sometimes what it must be like to you know to do this the sort of thing that, that you do and i think to me i feel like the hardest thing to live with would be not knowing the outcome of it uh when you have gotten that what uh how often does it happen where you get that it more often now now that it's just the smaller big move little move podcast i think because i have a smaller pool of people they're a little bit more likely to be checking back in mm -hmm. and i don't have to manage the big big dear prudence inbox that's janae's problem now <laughs> uh, but i did this was the best update i ever got recently i was recording with someone and we, we did a great episode they just had like really fabulous thoughtful like pithy advice it was fantastic and at the end just as we were about to say goodbye, they said, by the way, I didn't mention this earlier, but you actually answered a question of mine. I listened to this years. episode. Yeah. And so they had they had been the person who had written in saying, I've been working at this nonprofit for a few years. And I feel really exploited. My boss keeps giving me these promotions, but no more money. And I'm like taking on credit card debt, paying like my rent, and my bills, and they they won't pay me enough to live on. And I was like, please, please, please quit your job. Um, and they did. And so at the end of the episode, they were like, and I quit my job and it worked out, which again, like you always know that if you advise someone to quit their job, there's also the risk that no matter how bad their job is, like things could get worse. So hearing again, like, and at the end too, when we were all done and I thought it was just a regular episode. Uh, that was truly, truly good. Okay. Cause I, for some, I was listening to that episode and I just assumed you knew from the beginning because I, I, oh, you know what? Because you did an intro then, I think, where you said, oh, this is it. So mm -hmm. I didn't know that you hadn't known that the whole time, but that is an absolutely spectacular thing. Is there any of these letters that haunt you in the night? No. Part of it is like the helpfulness of a, a bad memory. Um, you know, I have other stuff that, like, my pedophile father haunts me at night, you know? Oh, like, that's what it. <laughs> um, And I think, I, I think I have a pretty stable relationship to the questions that I get asked, which mm -hmm. sometimes they're moving or sad or distressing. Certainly sometimes like with the toenail stuff, it gets stuck in your memory a little bit. But for the most part, I think I've done a pretty good job of letting it go just because I don't get to follow people around. I don't know the names of people who write to me. It wouldn't do them any good if I ruminated on it endlessly. Um, so while it's fun to revisit them and reminisce, I think it's good and important to also at a certain stage, let it go. But I do right now have one update that's still been sitting in my inbox for a little while. It's from somebody who listened to my answer on an episode of the show and really felt like we had been just making fun of her and being like really cruel. And you know, my first response on reading that was like, I don't think I did that at all, but I want to go back and listen to it before I answer that again. Um, not so I can either say like, you're wrong, I was being nice, or you're right, I was being mean, but just to try to get a sense of, is there anything I could have missed in that first conversation or knowing more about her state of mind now, can I, you know, um, offer any new kind of input, even though, you know, she may not listen to the show anymore. But um, usually if I hear back from people, it's more like I did it and it worked out. I think you're likelier to get an update if something good happened. Um, I think people are less likely to write back with an update if it's like, I didn't take your advice or I kind of took your advice and things mostly stayed the same. Like you just, it doesn't stick in, it's, it's like leaving a review on Amazon. You're likelier to do it if something like changed your life for the better or if you fucking hated it. Or when I was mean to Paul Reiser once. It'll... Who would be mean to Paul Reiser? 
Yeah, no, I was sort of shading somebody else's book and I, I, I was rude. And this has haunted me for as long as I've had an Amazon account that I, I said something snud and discounted Paul Reiser in this. And I, I actually tried to get back to this recently, even though it was probably in the late 90s that I left this because I have developed tremendous respect for Paul Reiser um, in the intervening times. Paul Reiser, if you're watching this, and I really hope you are, I'm, I'm sorry that I discounted your, your merit and weight as a human and as a comedian because you, I was wrong. Well, hopefully he didn't read it. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, Paul Reiser, if you're, if you're watching this, um, your, your book Babyhood in the mid nineties, I, for some reason, when I was like nine years old, I thought it was the best book in the world. Um, and I, I read it over and over again. I was just like, this man's a genius. So thank you. Uh, you really blew me away. <laughs> How often do you feel like you've gotten people fake letter writers? Does that, that, does that happen? I, sometimes I'm sure, uh, or, or like once in a while, somebody would say in the comments, like I saw this on Reddit last month, or mm -hmm. occasionally actually somebody would say, oh, I saw this on like Ask Carolyn. Um, or, or a different advice column, which I would think is kind of cool. Cause I like, it, it makes sense to me if you've got a problem and you want somebody to answer it fast, you want to maximize your chances by sending it out a lot. Um, you know, some, I know there was that one guy who wrote that essay about sending me a bunch of fake letters. Oh, but, I remember. You know, it, it's one of those things where like, if somebody wants to write you a fake letter, you know, you can certainly do your best to think like, oh, I think I recognize the plot of Brideshead Revisited here. but. No, I mean, you know, somebody else was pointing out earlier, like, Danny, I usually don't know your film and book references. There's so many movies and books uh, and TV shows in the world. No one person could possibly be familiar with the plot points of all of them. So there's just always going to be uh, certain blind spots that any advice columnist will have. And it really just is, if somebody wants to write you a fake letter, it's very easy to make a fake email account and it's free. So uh, I don't think there's any way to you know, aside from just gut instincts, like totally get rid of them. Um, and it's not like this is a peer reviewed journal where we're publishing like findings. So it's like, you know, the worst thing that can happen is maybe like my ego gets a little bit bruised, but you know, that's not, that's not going to hurt anybody really. So I think it's one of those things where like, if somebody wants to, they sure can. And it doesn't, it doesn't really experience for anybody else. Um, unless it was just like week after week of like, someone's just describing the plot of Plan 9 from outer space and that's all I'm answering, taking it totally seriously. Like, I think that would probably eventually drive people away. So I, we're, we're getting toward the end here. So folks, if you have questions, please put them in there. What is the best advice you've ever given and the best advice you've ever gotten? Um, I've gotten a lot of really good advice uh, over the years. And um, I think two of the best pieces of advice I've gotten, one had to do with, you know, if you're hearing criticism or feedback from somebody and you don't like it, do your best to separate the way that they said it from what they were saying so that you don't out of hand, even if somebody who really doesn't like you, doesn't think well of you, wants you to fail, is saying something snide that hurts your feelings. It doesn't always mean that there's not anything useful in there. And conversely, if uh, you know somebody that you don't think very well of says something nice about you, there might be something useful in that too. And that doesn't mean that you have to, um, you know, uh, accept any kind of treatment from anybody, or that every time somebody like yells something at you on the street, you have to be like, "Oh, I better go meditate on what that meant." Um, but I just found it useful because I, I, I tend to, um, I, I tend to be sensitive about anything that is less than like, "Danny, you're perfect." which is not a reasonable approach to the world. And so it was really useful to hear, like, um, let go for a moment your feelings about how it was said and think about the content. Do you think there's anything worthwhile there? And then, you know, again, this will sound a little bit cheap, but I think the best advice I ever gave anybody um, was to my family when I found out uh, what they had been doing um, with my brother uh, and making sure uh, that they, uh, they were making sure that he had uh, unsupervised access to children because he claimed it helped him treat his pedophilia. And when I found out, I said, I'm going to stop it. And um, they really didn't want me to do that, um, up to and including uh, sending me messages saying, if you report him, he might try to kill himself. Mm -hmm. in your head. Um, and I said, if you think he's trying to kill himself, take him to the hospital. 
and that was just that was it um and i think i gave them good advice you know i i I had sent them a list of therapists who could treat him in the area because they had all made this big to do about how he could never see a therapist. Um, and I was like, here's three, here's three people within a half hour drive who treat people with his exact like conditions. Um, and they're all, you know, right, right there. You could have done this at any time. Um, he does not need access to children to be well. He needs treatment in order needs distance from children to be safe for children and you know that's just like that's true that's simple you say it out loud and it sounds reasonable um that's good advice like that feels pretty universally good and again like part of me felt like there were two versions of my parents that i was seeing in that because like one version of my parents i felt like had raised me to act right in that moment mm -hmm. it taught me right from wrong and it was baffling to me that those parents didn't seem to exist in the moment. All of a sudden, everything I thought that they stood for was gone. And so I really did feel in that moment like I had a phantom version of John and Nancy with me. The better versions of themselves, wherever they were in that moment, they were like, no, this isn't the right thing to do. You know the right thing. Go do that, no matter what happens. And again, I'm, I'm very aware they're all the same people. There's not a split there. Um, but it really did help in that moment. Just know the right thing is, you know, in recovery, people often talk about just focus on the next right thing. And that's the, I think the last piece of good advice is just like, what's the next right thing? Don't, don't let him work with kids. Great. What do we have to do to make that happen? And then it all was just super clear. Because things can seem very, very large and insurmountable, but those, those little bits, the moment by moment, seven seconds by seven seconds or whatever the the version of that happens to be i think is is a really really smart bite-sized way to go through it and those bites add up to a whole damn meal of a life sorry that was a terrible metaphor i am a figure yeah. i promise yeah um, they wanted it to be complicated they wanted it to be so complicated they wanted his situation to be so unique that we could never take it outside of a circle of the family um, and it just wasn't it was really simple yeah and sometimes the you know the the scary thing is the simple thing is the right thing and it doesn't that's you know sometimes the, these things are all true at once and sometimes you just have to take it that little bit by by a little bit yeah. and and i think we are coming up on time so i'm going to invite uh er back mm -hmm. in but thank you for being danny <laughs> oh, Pat, thank you so much this has been such a lovely conversation and so like interesting and powerful to think about some of these things together with you. I'm really grateful. Right back at you. And I'm, I'm coming back to you, my camera's just okay. <laughs> it's making sure. I am such a like weirdo about time and, and sticking to it. I was several minutes late for a meeting yesterday and I'm a thumb picker and I picked it all the way off on the way uh, to that. So yes. you're gonna find it in your coffee in the morning. <laughs> How will I separate that out from the uh, nail clippings that my husband has put in there? <laughs> People need to get this book. It's 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 so tremendously good. Give it to your your friends, your your and enemies. Even if he just does it at the couch, why wouldn't you, when you get up, think, oh, I'll pick them up with me and put them in the trash can? That's so that's such a small change that she was asking of him. It wasn't even don't do this. It was just pick them up with you when you go. I live my life by the code that it should be illegal to have nail clippers on a keychain. I thought you were going to say I live my life a quarter mile at a time. And like oh. Dominic Toretto is like this guy's approach to life, which is just like, oh when I'm clipping my toenails, I'm clipping my toenails. When I get up, I get up. The past is the past. <laughs> toenails are tomorrow's coffee grounds. <laughs> oh. um, are. we are vamping my man i know well i'm gonna and so if you guys can hear me i'm just gonna i'm gonna be a disembodied voice uh because my camera's acted up so i'm just gonna say thank you both so much this was so fun um i want to encourage everybody to click this teal button at the bottom of the screen that's a one click button to buy deal dear prudence um from karis it really does help us when you buy your event books from us um you can also buy cat's book from us you can buy danny's other books from us um, you can buy one for a friend, uh, request books from the library, all the things. Um, it really, buy Middlemarch. Yeah, buy Middlemarch. I mean, you know, whatever, bone up so that if someone, 
you know, ask you a masquerading question, you'll, you'll know and <laughs> be on top of it. Um, but really and truly, thank you both. Um, this was so fun. And thank you, Danny, for all that you do. And um, Kat, folks, where, where, should, where should folks look out for your work? Um, food and wine? Where else? Foodandwine.com. All right, cool. Um, Danny, is there any other project or anything you want to plug before we say goodnight? No, I'm around. All right, <laughs> cool. Well, um, thank you all. Stay safe and well, and um, hope, to, hope to see you again.